asked to talk on optimization of treatment of MDR bacteria, and I sort of going to talk on sl something slightly different. The same topic, but a different title. So I thought I'd talk about the subtleties, because what it really means is the subtleties of PKPD, and really means the drug levels over the MIC for MDR organisms. And to define MDR organisms, there was an article in 2012 defining it as the required non-susceptibility to at least one agent in three or more antimicrobial categories, and I'm going to use that. You also then have extensive drug resistance and pan-drug resistance. But if you look at that article, they also talk in that article about the antimicrobial susceptibility testing. And for this, I have to thank uh, Narel George and, and Claire Heaney, and I'm talking almost out of context here. So this is an intensivist's impression of what they thought or what they sent me. So antimicrobial susceptibility or sensitivity testing is really related to the uh, MICs, which are serial doubling dilutions for each antibiotic. Although MBCs in the same category, it seems to have lost <coughs> vogue, and it may, in fact, I think, come back into to vogue as well. So just bear with me, the microbiologist, but uh, the MIC is the first concentration uh, where there's no visible growth. So you dilute your, your antibiotic against, uh, or you increase your antibiotic to the bacteria, and then eventually you don't get any growth. And there are various ways of testing uh, the, these growths. There's diffusion testing, there's dilution testing, but there's no proper or correct uh, combination. Uh, and the most, one of the most common is, uh, use, or one of the most common ways is, the mini is testing with an e-test, and you put uh, antibiotic uh, on a bacterial growth and you get this type of uh, inhibition, and you can measure the, the inhibition on that. But as Claire has pointed out to me, it's not that easy often, so you get this type of picture, and you can't really see the MIC, or that type of picture, and it doesn't really come out that well. So there are problems with that MIC, and then you can put it all together into a, into a nice machine, which is less, which is more objective, and, uh, but has its own problems, and you can do it on a Vitec. So there are various ways of looking at MICs. And then when you get an MIC of one organism, you can look at a thousand of those organisms and test different distribution of MICs, and that allows you to work out the breakpoints. So it's a different uh, concept, certainly from an intensivist point of view, it's a different concept, uh, and you've got to get your head right. It's not an MIC, it's a different, uh, it's a distribution of MICs, and it's usually due, related to two distinct uh, populations, a susceptible group and a resistant group, but sometimes there's an intermediate group. So again, uh, uh, from Claire and Narelle's slides, here is a reference to a, to a UCAST MIC distribution database where there are, uh, I think, 5,000 observations of uh, amoxicillin against E. coli. And there's a nice susceptible group and there's a nice resistant group. So you can look at your breakpoints as to your right susceptible or sensitive, and to your left resistant. And you can have a, a break point there. That's nice and easy and self-explanatory. Uh, and then you get this type of distribution where we think that, that this part is sensitive and that part's resistant. So this is a, a more recent database, but it's the same concept. You have 4,000 organisms. So, just to put in perspective, the MIC is the MIC. But breakpoints are an interpretation of the MIC into susceptible, intermediate, and resistant. And there are different breakpoints for different antibiotics and different organisms. And there's no internationally agreed uh, set of breakpoints, which is another problem. So we use UCAST, but there are other breakpoints as well. And if you think that is explanatory, uh, simple, and I've tried to simplify it as 
what I understand, and I hope I'm right. But then you get this type of curve where you can't really look at sensitive and resistant. So this is even more difficult. So if anybody is really interested in it, there was a re an excellent article with John Turnage and uh, Johan Mouton uh, looking at some of these MIC-based adjustments. So you can probably get a lot of the data out of that. And it's really a, a good article. And it, I think it, is, it certainly changed my understanding of things. So we in Brisbane here yeah, get breakpoints. We get this type of uh, uh, picture when we log into into the system and we get S's and R's. And just remember that we are using the UCAST uh, breakpoints. And as I say, there are other breakpoints as well. So the first message I want to bring home to the audience is the MRCs are not very accurate. On our ward rounds every Thursday and Monday, Claire says, you know, you measure your drug levels, the MRCs are less accurate. And I didn't understand exactly what she said until she sent me the slides. So the MRCs are not very accurate. The breakpoints are, break are relatively arbitrarily <coughs> defined. So that's the first part of your uh, denominator uh, of the PK, PD, or drug MRC ratios. I want to change track a little bit, and I'll get back onto that um, in, in a minute. The, to look at the numerator, the, the drug levels, I think you must realize that there are two big different antibiotic groups in relation to how they kill. There's the concentration-dependent kill characteristic where increasing the concentration increases the kill, aminoglycosides. You want a peak level, I'll show you in a second. And then non-concentration or time-dependent beta-lactams. So if I give you a dose of a drug, intravenously you'll get a rise in concentration and then a fall-off depending on volume of distribution or, and clearances. But the concentration-dependent group need the high peak, the the, the aminoglycoside need a high peak, and then the non-concentration or time-dependent group need a high MIC, a uh, high time above MIC. Now, there are various parameters that are supposedly optimum for time above MIC, and Jason led this big group looking at uh, uh, reviewing the topic, uh, and the carbapenems seem to have a different time above MIC time above MIC for maximum killing. But just point, I want to point out that in the review, there was a different time above MIC for clinical cure and for microbiological cure. And then the other, the other beta-lactams have different theoretical optimum time above MICs. And I see Gloria Wong is in the audience here. She read, uh, uh, led this international multi-center survey of, of what people use for endpoints for, for adjustment of their beta-lactams, and it varies from place to place. So, just remember that, to, to put back into perspective, if there is a problem in determining your MRC and their dilutional effects, so it's not accurate, it may be two or four times different, but if that's an MRC of X, and that's a time of that MRC, and you're slightly inaccurate in determining your MRC, and the MRC is that, look at the time above MRC, it's a lot less. And if you're even more inaccurate, your time above MRC, time above MRC is significantly a problem if your MRC is not accurate, even though your drug concentrations may be accurate. So we believe you should be using aggressive targets for your time above MRC. And we, we arbitrarily will use, or we have standard here, of four times MRC for all our organisms. But that's partly related to what we believe is correct literature and partly related to the inaccuracy of the MRC determination. So let's go back into the drug levels a little bit more. Um, just remember that the way a drug is used, it starts off in either animal models or in test tubes these days, gets put into human volunteers, medical students or students needing money, and then into relatively sick patients. But they're not the sick patients in ICU, and then the drug gets registered with a standard drug insert. But it's not the same as the patients I see every day in the intensive care unit, where uh, 
there's hemodynamic alterations, we put pipes into every orifice, we make our own orifice with pipes, and we then give a lot of fluids, and we assume that the package insert, which is the almost non-sick or the relatively non-sick patients, would work the same, the package insert dosing would work the same in ICU. So when you look at it carefully, this is a standard ICU patient with a whole lot of drips and fluids, and what, the dosing is incorrect in ICU. And not understand, and not surprisingly. <laughs> so the first thing you've got to realise is that when we have these sick, difficult patients who we're pouring fluid in to get their blood pressure up, their volume of distribution of the fluid changes, and therefore, depending where the drug goes, the volume of distribution of the drug changes. So you've got to fill up that volume of distribution when you want time to antibiotics. You really need time to optimum antibiotics. <coughs> and if you don't have that optimum antibiotics, we reviewed this, it must be 10 years ago already, that all antibiotics will have resistance developing if you underdose. In other words, it's Darwinian principle. You give the, anti, the bug a little bit of antibiotics and the resistant bacteria grow up by a, just by a Darwinian principle, survival of the fittest. So that we, we again reviewed the topic. Just remember you need a, a big loading dose for most of the drugs, particularly the hydrophilic agents, independent of your renal or your clearances. Eh? So you've got to give a, a higher dose for your volume of distribution. And the, so the volume of distribution changes in ICU that's the first big issue in ICU. And the second big issue in ICU, I'm going to talk about clearances in a second. So we conceptually designed this schematic representation of sepsis with patients with, in, with normal function, like the medical students, normal plasma concentrations. A lot of patients will have end organ dysfunction and you have to decrease the dose, no question. But this is a group that I've concentrated on for many years Increased cardiac output, increased leaky capillaries, and increased clearances. So let's just look at clearances for a minute. There's a group of patients in ICU that took me a while to work out that have increased clearances. Now, you and I, as we sit here, have creatinine clearances of about 100, 120 mils a minute, unless we've got renal dysfunction. And if, we, if patients have decreased clearance, in other words, renal dysfunction, decreased clearance, the drug clearance will be decreased if a drug is from the kidneys, and we know that for years. So we did <coughs> two studies, Kefepim and Kef, uh, Kefparo, and we showed that for some reason, Kefparo patients had a much higher drug clearance than, than uh, the Kefepim patients. And what we worked out eventually was there's a group of patients in ICU, and it just so happened to be the Kefparone patients in that group, had higher creatinine clearances than you and me. So instead of 100 to 120 mils per minute, patients in ICU can have creatinine clearances up to 200, 250 mils per minute. Now, if you do your extrapolation from renal dysfunction databases, MDRD, uh, Gould Crockroft, it doesn't work in ICU. They weren't made for ICU, they weren't examined in ICU, and it doesn't work for ICU. So if you measure creatinine clearance in ICU, there'll be a group of patients with huge creatinine clearances. <coughs> huge creatinine clearances mean renally excreted drug gets cleared quickly. If, renally, if the drug is renally excreted, you're going to be underdosing at the standard doses. And we've called that, just arbitrarily, one standard deviation above the norm, Augmented renal clearance. And then the next question is, how many patients in ICUs get augmented renal clearance? So we did a multi-center study, looked at all patients with normal serum creatinines in ICU, 100 patients from four different units, S Portugal, Singapore, Hong Kong, and us. 65% of that group of patients that come into ICU with a normal serum creatinine have augmented renal clearance. Now, it's not the patients that come in with renal dysfunction. Normal serum creatinine in a multidisciplinary ICU, 65% of them, if you measure creatinine clearance, it'll be high. And there are reasons for that. It's, I don't want to go into it too much, but the physiological reasons of an inflammatory response increasing your cardiac output, your tissues say, hang on, I'm sick, 
I want more blood supply. It's a teleological response. If you have this increased phenomenon of inflammation and increased blood supply or increased blood flow, and your kidneys are normal, increased blood flow, increased cardiac output, normal kidneys, increased renal blood flow. Increased renal blood flow, increased creatinine clearance and augmented renal clearance. It teleologically works. So you've got to increase your frequency if you need time above MIC. Now that's that part of the equation. Jason recently has pointed out that that part of the equation is even more important. Extracorporeal circuits, be it CRRT or ECMO or whatever other things we tend to do in ICUs. We're adding, we, not, we, we lock our toys, eh? we add new things all the time. So I just want to point out that CRRT, continuous renal replacement therapy, is nice in concept. You're putting blood across the semi-permeable membrane and taking off the bad products, just like your kidney should. So you put artificial kidneys there when you have renal dysfunction. Right? And we know that it takes off water nicely. We know it takes off small molecules nicely. But it also takes off, so it takes off the bad guys, but it may take off the good guys. And then you have, we do dialysis differently to the PA, differently to Europe, differently to Israel. Eat, we, we've, we've bastardized a standard intermittent dialysis regime from the wards, put it in ICU, think we're clever, we all set it up differently. Right? And there's CVVH, there's CVVHD, there's CVVHDF, there's SCUD, there's SLED. And yes, we're taking off the bad guys. We're taking off urea and creatinine, we're taking off potassium, easy. But we're taking off antibiotics and taking off the good guys, which we haven't even measured yet. That's a lot of nutrition as well, for example. So, we, Jason's leading a, a renal replacement CRRT trial and we're about to analyse the results. And until you get those results, whatever textbook or whatever article you're reading on CRRT is probably wrong because they set up differently to what you're setting up. So we said to a whole lot of people, just tell us what you use on dialysis, tell us the dose, give us the samples and we'll measure the samples and then we'll compute how you should and how other people with your technology should use CRRT and antibiotics. So extracorporeal circuits is a problem. That leads me on to therapeutic drug monitoring, which I believe is the only way to really measure. Now, it was set up to minimize toxicity. With beta-lactams, we're using it to maximize efficacy. And this is why you need it in ICU, because not only blood flow changes, there's capillary leaks, there's decreased blood flow, there's extra corporeal circuits, and it's a mess in ICU. So unless you are measuring what you're doing, I think you're shooting in the dark. And that goes for nutrition, it goes for antibiotics, it goes for vitamins, it goes for everything in ICU. We're clever with our machinery, and we're looking at the big picture, but I'm sure we're going to be changing our treatment a lot in time. So to get back to what I try to give you in background, the subtleties of drug level, which is a diff difficult problem in ICU, over the MIC. Right? So I've given you some concepts. Now look what happens with the resistant organisms. It's the same type of thing. If MIC goes up, so your time above MIC for the same dose changes. So not only may your MIC be a different, but as you're getting more and more resistant organisms, so your time above MIC changes. So use aggressive targets. Right? And the targets, certainly for, for killing, may be different to resistance. In the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about technology that we've got at Pace, and I see some of the, uh, some of the uh, group running our hollow fiber uh, laboratory are here. So... We're not geniuses. We were told in 1940, we're not geniuses. We were told by a genius, Fleming, 1945, if there's a danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself by exposing microbes to non-lethal quantities of these drugs and they'll become resistant. So there's a hollow fiber, and I'll put this in perspective of MDR treatment in a second. Hollow fiber infection model allows 
a hollow fiber to be impregnated with bacteria, to be set up with a circuit through which you can uh, perfuse antibiotics at certain concentrations, change the concentration, add antibiotics if you want, dual combination, a dual therapy. And I want to point out that MRC is a static uh, measurement. So here is a kill characteristic of piperacillin. There's the colony forming units growing. And if you look at that part of the curve before the, cur before the circle, you look at that part of the curve, and it looks like the organism is sensitive to the dosing of piperacillin because the MRC will be such that you get drop off of the colony forming units initially. But if you look at this axis here over time, you will get regrowth unless you give whopping big doses. So the organisms in the hollow fiber become resistant and grow up. Right? And not only do they grow up, depending on your dose, so when they do grow up, if you measure the MRCs, they grow up at a much higher MRC. So it's, again, the Darwinian principle of the resistant organisms growing up. So unless you kill all the organisms, you've got a problem. Now, you can't obviously kill all the organisms, but there's a re the dosing that we're using is one thing, and the development of resistance, what I'm showing to you here, is probably different. And this is very recent data. Unless you use very, very high doses of propicillin, you'll get re a purposeful tazobactam, you get regrowth, and the same thing happens. Very high doses of meropenem, you're going to get regrowth. And then the hollow fiber allows you, certainly in vivo, to look at resistant uh, organisms and bacteria uh, and antibiotics against that. So here is a, a, a schematic represent. Well, here is growth of a of a colony forming organism with phosphomycin that looks resistant, amikacin that looks resistant, and you put the two together, and there's kill off. And I see, uh, this will show you that you can, in vitro, use double gram negative cover. So in conclusion, <coughs> just remember the package inserts are not wisely generalizable. Guidelines take a long time to be developed. Understanding the MRC and breakpoints is important. Use aggressive targets and use double gram negative cover. And what I'm going to suggest here is if you're unable to measure drug levels, use the higher dose. So I can't tell you how to use a specific drug in a specific resistant organism, but unless you've got those concepts, you're going to not dose properly and underdose. And RCTs are going to be difficult. I think that the, there has to be extrapolation from surrogate outcomes of PKPD. Hollow fiber mechanism, uh, hollow fiber infection model will help us, and I, I haven't had time to talk about inhaled antibiotics, but that to me is how we're going to be looking at MDR organisms. Uh, sure, there's a colistin and uh, combination therapy showing RCTs that uh, without combina uh, that colistin is and combination is not better, but I think we're going to have to look at PKPD endpoints and hollow fiber mechanisms to help us with MDR organisms. Thank you for your time.